Hi, I'm Lee Meadowboy. I'm an English professor at the University of Arizona. I'm Eva Chernyavsky, and I'm an English professor at the University of Washington. And you are watching Keywords with the Simpson Center for the Humanities. I think it's also a tricky term because it depends a little bit at what scale you want to think about. Are you thinking about it at the scale of governments and institutions? Are you thinking about that at a transnational scale or at a national scale? Are you thinking about it at the level of culture and everyday life? Um, so I think the answer to the question sort of shifts a little bit depending Definitely. at what level you're looking at it. There's a way of thinking about neoliberalism that makes it very big, that makes it about right. free trade agreements and uh, public right. policy, but there's also this kind of micro-politics of yes. neoliberalism that's about how to change the way that human beings understand themselves and the way that they behave. And, and this, this is something I hear people play both sides of. Is neoliberalism more something that uh, we respond to because we are, in a sense, kind of educated to be neoliberals, or is it something that we start to uh, conduct ourselves in relation to because different kinds of um, market forces or social frameworks kind of give us no choice? That's, I think, a big debate um, in the field. How is it that, um, <clears throat> what are we actually talking about when we talk about a culture of uh, sort of self-management, entrepreneurship, this kind of um, persistent cost-benefit analysis in relation to one's own life choices, is that a kind of ideological position? Or is that something more, more subtle that happens through um, the way in which our environment has been laid out for us? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a neoliberalism, so I guess that's a place to start. Um, there's an old liberalism that presumably ran out of steam sometime in the 1920s. It was a liberalism of free markets. It was a liberalism of, uh, you know, uh, individualism and free speech. And uh, at some point, I guess, in the 20s or 30s, with the rise of fascism, the communist revolution, the New Deal, there were a group of intellectuals that were worried that liberalism was uh, on its way out and they wanted to revive it, hence neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. And nobody wanted to call themselves a neoliberal for quite a while. Right. <laughs> right. Um, it's at some point, I guess, uh, in the last 10 years that you begin to see people reclaiming the, openly. and openly yeah. and saying, yeah, that's who we are. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I came to this topic a little bit later, kind of in the way in the, I started thinking about it in the early aughts, and it was really trying to understand the political moment we were in, the political present, um, and then started to become interested in which were the forms of culture that refracted our moment in a way that I thought was interesting or compelling or generative. So for instance, the project I'm working on right now is a project on zombie apocalypse narrative, which is pervasive, which is clearly zombie apocalypse narratives in graphic novels, right? it's in comics, it's in film, it's in television series, it's in fiction, it's, it's ubiquitous, um, it's proliferating. Um, and it is a way, I think, of thinking about our current moment. Um, I'm particularly interested in what the zombie horde might be able to tell us about mass politics and mass mobilization. We're thinking about that in a really different way from, uh, from the way we can if we approach it as a problem in political, political theory. There's a certain, you know, in any kind of genre, right, there's a certain kind of a uh, set version of the zombie apocalypse, which which uh, many people have actually talked about, right? Where it's the it's a completely dystopian account in which it's a kind of um, uh, man eat man, right? Complete scarcity economy, and it's whoever can amass the most the most goods and the most power the most quickly. And of course, it's pretty pretty easy to relate that to a certain kind of um, mode of neoliberal subjectivity, right? Right. Right. Um, but I also think the genre inevitably ends up doing more interesting things than that. Right. Anyway. 
but 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 yeah, there's definitely a kind of survivalist logic yes. that you know comes out. In there the, are the, people who read it. Um, there's a comic <coughs> I read, the comic version of The Walking Dead, which has letters to the editor, and it's really interesting that the people who write in, which is sort of an interesting way of taking the measure of, of how readers read this, uh, some of them literally do seem to treat it as a how-to manual yep. of how to survive the coming apocalypse, which is yeah um, yeah worth a little story in this day and age. Um, well, that's where I think. I mean, neoliberalism just begins to interact with all sorts of other uh, kind of situations like the climate crisis. Yes. Um, you know, neo certainly one thing people say about the neoliberal era is it's been a kind of period of stagnating wages and sort of like, you know, increasingly tough job markets. Um, and so in some way, neoliberalism seems to be about getting individuals to shoulder the burden of that which is a kind of survivalist situation. You keep yourself alive. Right. And if you succeed, if you're nimble enough, if you're creative enough in sort of investing the right way, you will yeah. find a way. Um, and one of the questions that's often debated in these zombie apocalypse genres is whether your survival should entail any commitment to anyone else's survival, right? So there's a deeply dystopian version where it's a zero-sum game, and your yep. survival is clearly at the expense of another versus more sort of communitarian ethics of survival, which can be read as more complexly pushing against those kinds of neoliberal norms. Yeah, do you think, I mean, one thing I've been sort of wondering about is whether there, you know, we are, another thing people do in cultural studies all the time um, is look for moments of resistance, look right. for ways that texts um, allow people to kind of step out of, criticize, or even sort of mobilize together against certain kind of forms of power that, you know, kind of um, invest their lives. So I kind of wonder if that sort of communitarian impulse is sometimes a sort of way of trying to imagine something other than... I think it's a kind of imaginary resource. I mean, one of the big, one of the questions that bedevils people who work on neoliberalism is how to imagine opposition to neoliberalism. I mean, most of most critics writing about it are writing it and it, about it with an either an explicit or implicit investment in figuring out what it would take to unthink it. Um, and that is a big question.